Yeah, we have we are family. It's yeah. it's been quite a weekend, and uh, God's God had a plan, a setup, a launch point um, f- for this weekend. This the, you know, there's the Bible says there is a set when the set time came. Jesus was born right in the set time. God has set times, and I believe this weekend was a set time for for the UK and for Victory Churches in the UK. A set time for the church here in Rougie that this is going and there's a launch point. This when prophesied that the first night there's a launch point, and there, you can just sense, you know, when when a when a rocket when you've when you've seen you know rockets at, about to launch, there's a vibration that happens. I mean the things firing up before it takes off, and you can feel it. You can sense that. I, you know, this morning, even in worship, you can sense that. As, last night, as people were, were, were just talking and buzzing, you could just sense there's a, the, the foundations buzzing, it's moving, and are about to be launched. Um, and, and for great things. I mean, there's been such a, an amazing synergy uh, here, and it's been a pr- privilege uh, to, to minister this weekend and just to see how you know, you know, Wynn starts preaching on, on uh, Friday night. I was like, man, he took half my notes. And his preacher was like, wow. And I was like, okay, let's move that along. And then, and then Phil preaches. With such a synergy, we're almost wearing the same, same shirt. This is, this is the, I'm like, look at this. Look at this. This is like, <laughs> you didn't get the memory. <laughs> but it's uh, I, such a synergy. And he starts preaching. I was like, wow. You know, and, and, and I was this morning as your, as your pastor stands up here and I'm looking going, there's an apostolic networking anointing on you that networks ministries together. And that's going to increase, not, not decrease, but, but networks ministries together that, that the kingdom of God around the world, just you have to admire the gift. Don't, don't just get familiar with the gift that you have here and take for granted the pastor that you have. And the pastors that you have, because there's, there's, you know, ad- admire the gift. There's a gift here that God is using internationally to set up His His kingdom for the last times, a launch point from here into the nations, and it's it's uh, a, a, you know, an honor. I, I shared this yesterday, but uh, the very first prophecy I ever received in my life was from your pastor, um, and I was just brand new to Victory Churches, brand new to being filled with the Holy Spirit plucked me out of, a, 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 out of a crowd of 700 people, stopped in the middle of his message, pointed me out and said, young man, stand up, and then proceeded to read my mail. And I never forgot that. And I was like, wow, this, it, it was a launch point for me. And so a privilege to be able to come back uh, uh, here in, in this church and, and, and contribute even just a little bit to, to the launch of what God wants to do in the UK. It's amazing. If you have to him who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the church uh, this weekend, God is doing something extraordinary and preparing for something extraordinary, yeah, um, exciting. We, I began yesterday by talking about mindsets and, and, you know, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he that you're, that, that you know, above all else guards your heart for out of it flows the issues which translated into English that word issues literally means boundaries or fences that guard your heart thinking because out of it flows the fences or the boundaries of your life that God will farm to the fence line, that God will, can do according to what your, you know, what your heart thinks. And um, Proverbs 16.9, a, a disturbing verse for me, but Proverbs 16.9 says, says that uh, the heart of a man plans his way, but the Lord directs his steps. You know, I'd prefer it to say that God gets to plan my way and I choose my steps. But, but it doesn't say that. It says that my heart plans my way, plans my life, that, that my heart thinking, what you see in your heart, what you envision in your heart is what God did. Elisha envisioned in his heart double the anointing of Elijah, and that is what God did. Right? 
Abraham, God had to change Abraham's heart thinking to, for him to, to be able to envision what, what his future was for that to happen. And you begin to see, I mean, God gave Joseph a dream in order for him to fulfill his destiny. He had to see it first, and he held on to that in his mental picture in, in, while being a slave, while being in prison. He had, this, he had this mental picture of how he was able to do that because this is what my destiny is. I've seen it, and I, I'm there set to that destiny. And, and you, we need to, it's alarming to me that if my heart thinking can choose my destiny, I want to expand my boundaries. I want to expand my heart thinking. I want to be able to, I want to, I want to continue to work on, and above all else, Solomon said, the wisest man who ever lived, said the most important thing I could ever say to you is, is pay attention to your heart boundaries. Right, so pay attention to your own heart boundaries. Do things and, 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 and constantly pray to expand. God, expand my heart. God, expand my heart. God, help me to see bigger. Because this, 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 is, this is an alarming for, for me. Uh, hopefully it is for you as well. But for me, the number of souls going into eternity in my city aren't determined by God's will or not God's will. God wills that none would perish. God's will is that none would perish. The determination of the souls in my city and who's going to be reached in my city has to do with my heart thinking. What I can believe for. God, expand my thinking. God, let me see bigger. I've got, I've got pictures on every tablet, every phone, every, every computer that I have in my car, on, on the screen in, in my car. I have, I have pictures of mega churches and things and, and full crowds and full seats. And I do this because, God, I want to see that. I want to I be able to see thousands come to Christ. Expanding, all that expands your heart thinking. It's vital that we expand what we think. How many times do you say, I am, dot, dot, dot. You can explain what the rest, fill in the blank. How many times when you say, I am, is the, is the end of that sentence negative? I am tired. I am cold. I am, I, I am not able. I am just whatever. How many times do we say these I am statements? Jesus constantly said I am statements, proclaiming who he was and what he was about to do. He would say something. He would say, I am the light of the world, right as he was about to step into a dark place and, and minister in a dark place. I am the bread of life, right about when he was about to feed somebody. I am I am, the, you know, the way, the truth, the life. Right before, he would, he would say the I am statements right before these ministries happen. So, uh, you know, part of the heart thinking is, God, what are your own I am statements? What else? What are you saying? I, I am what? And we, not, if you're like me, when I started paying attention to my I am statements, I was like, whoa, wow. I got to change my confessions. Change what, what I'm saying about myself. And I began to, to begin to speak over my own, my own life differently and begin to see fruit differently come out because you simply change and expand. One of the ways to expand your thinking. Last night we, we did a crash course on Acts and we, uh, we learned very quickly that what made the early church so powerful and significant in reading the book of Acts and by the way, the book of Acts is the only chapter in the New Testament that doesn't conclude because the Acts of the church is not finished yet. There is no, there is no, uh, you know, and we're still in the Acts of the church. And, and the Bible promises that the last days are going to be greater than the former days. And, and, and the Acts of the church, what we read there, and while we envy that, that, that you know, we got to get our mindset to the same thing, dialed into the same station that these guys were dialed into and see the same results. But, but God promises that we're going to see greater results. We're the best. I love that. Feel. We're the best God's got. And, and, and think about this. Uh, you know, did you ever, did you ever read, you know, the, the Gospels and, and, and read about Peter and John and going, what would it be like to be one of the disciples to walk with Jesus physically? To, what would it have been like? What a privilege. What it would have been like 
to be Jesus' best friend, John? What have it been like to eat, sleep, and just, just sit at his feet and listen to him teach and watch? What have it been like to be one of the disciples? And I've often read those things. Man, I envy these guys. What would it be like? And you know God spoke to me one time, and he says, he says they're up here envying you. What would it be like to be, to be Kelly in the last days, in that moment? There's going to be greater miracles, fill the spirit with greater knowledge, greater ex, all the things. We had to, we had, they got ability to travel all over the world. They got technology that can spread the gospel all over the world. What would it be like in the last days? to be there. We have so much, so much, so much going for us. They envy us, and I was like, what? <laughs> Jesus. But their focus was always outsiders. Their focus was always, you know, give us boldness so that we can continue preaching. Their focus was, you know, you know Paul said, you know, I, I was... The, my heavenly vision is to, is, to, is to preach the gospel to the outsiders to turn them from light to dark. Sin to God. And the heavenly mission and the heavenly vision, they're heavenly. They haven't changed. They originated in heaven. And that's our Why? That's, that's why we exist. That's why we're here. That's why, you know, churches, that's why church gathers. That's our why, is to, is to bring light into darkness, is to bring hope to the hopeless, is to bring life to the lifeless. It's to, that's, that's our why. That's why we exist. And when we align ourselves to that heavenly vision, it, it, it's, it's not asking God to bless me. It's, it's finding out what God is blessing. What God is blessing is the heavenly vision. The heavenly mission hasn't changed. And if I align myself to that, watch the miracles happen. God, I want more miracles. God, I want to see more healings. Align yourself to the heavenly vision and watch what God does. This morning I want to teach the how. We're going to quickly go through, in 20, 25 minutes, we're going to go through the how. How do I do this? How do I... As Jesus said, this is the heavenly mission. Jesus said, go into all the world and make disciples. That mission, by the way, hasn't changed. That's the same mission. It wasn't just given to the 12. That mission is still the same. Go into all the world, preach the gospel, make disciples, baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I mean, uh, teaching them to, you know, carefully observe everything, you know, the word and everything written. In. This is, this is, this, the heavenly mission hasn't changed. It's the same mission. But here's the problem. Go into all the world and make disciples. Disciple is not a word that we use in our vocabulary very often. It's, it's, it's a confusing word. We, you know, we use the word apprentice more, more frequently and we use the word, you know, we, we use, you know, other words, but we don't, you know, I don't, you know, Pastor Will doesn't walk around and say, you know, these are my disciples. You, you kind of think, <laughs> okay, um, oh, high and mighty one, you know, you and your disciples. And he walks around and the, you know, people following him. These, we, don't ha we don't say that word. And it was, we don't, it's not a frequent, you know, in our modern day vocabulary. It's not something that we commonly say. So when we say the disciples go into all the world and make disciples, it's difficult for us to be able to, you know, how do I do this? And I've found, you know, I've talked with many pastors and many leaders, and I've said, okay, go into, what is a disciple? And I've had multiple different definitions of what one is. And, and the problem with, with that is, if I'm supposed to go and make one, I, I, I need to know what one is. So I can, I can make one. It's, it's difficult to make one if, you know, it, it's, it's, then if I don't know what it is. And I've had most pastors will, they would agree, well, disciples of, you know, an apprentice, a disciple is a fully devoted follower of Christ. Awesome. That's, that's a great definition, fully devoted follower of Christ. How do I know when somebody's fully devoted? How do, what, what's fully devoted? Is, what, you know, what's 90%? What's 80%? What, what is 95%? 90, am I 99%? Am I, is that fully devoted or, you know, not quite there? What is fully devoted? And, it's, it's, and I realized as a pastor, it's like, how do I teach my congregation to go and make disciples when I don't even know if it's, if it's a mist in the, in the pulpit, it's going to be a fog in the pew. 
And I was like, how do I? My job is to equip the saints for the work of the ministry, not to do the ministry, but to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. And I was like, how do I equip people to go and make disciples if I can't clearly define exactly what one is? We can get all riled up, go and reach the lost. Yeah, yeah, that's great. And we can go and, and go and reach the lost and lead them to Jesus. That's awesome. But that's making a convert. That's not making a disciple. And Jesus didn't say go into all the world and make converts. He said go into all the world and make disciples. Amen. And what he called his disciples, disciples, Peter was messed up. Thomas, he had a nickname, Doubter. He wasn't believer, Thomas. He was Doubter. I walked around and that's your nickname. That's your reputation. You, you doubt everything. How do you feel about that, Thomas? I doubt it. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I did, you know, all of these guys, Judas, and all the rest of them, they called the disciples. But at some point, something shifted in them. Something changed in them. And, and, and they, they, they changed, and their whole mentality changed. And they became the, you know, the apostles. They became, you know, the disciples of Jesus, what we know now as the disciple of Jesus. But there's a process Jesus took them through in the three years in the Gospels. And, and we got to learn, and I need to learn. I want to be like Jesus. I want to be able to, I want to be a disciple, and I want to help others be disciples. But what, what, what is one? We need to be able to find what one is. And so I began to search, search the scriptures and look at it. And, and the most clear process that I can see, interesting process, is found in 1 John 2. And it's a couple of verses that hit me hard. And so if you have your Bibles, you can turn with me to 1 John chapter 2. And John is the author. John is the beloved. John is a disciple. John's writing to the early church. And when he's writing to the early church, he uses some phraseology that I've read a hundred times, and I never really paid much attention to this. And yet, I began to meditate on this and, and think and dwell on this a little bit. And why did he say this in this way? And I began to see that he is defining the process of spiritual maturity. In the process of growing in our relationship with Jesus. And when I discovered what he was doing or what he was writing, I began to see that, hey, my job as a pastor as a, as a, is to lead people through this, this same similar process and begin to identify where they are and to help people identify where they are. Wouldn't it be, no, wouldn't it be great? How many want to know, you know, where am I in my spiritual maturity? Uh, you know, where do, where do I stack up? Where do I? It, John kind of tells us. So this, some of this might be an ouch, and some of this might be an encouragement, and some of this might be... But this, if I'm going to make a disciple, I want to know how, what process to take them through. That's just how my brain works. So John says in 1 John chapter 2, he says this in, in verse 12. He says, I'm writing to you, dear children... Because your sins have been forgiven on account of his name. Now, is this an insult? You know, I, you're reading this letter that, you know, stands up, and this is from, from John, and, and, you know, Pastor John, he's awesome. He's like, I write to you, we ones. It's like, okay, what? Why are you in is, is he writing to the children's ministry in there? But he's, he's, no, he says, because your sins have been forgiven on account of his name. I'm writing to you fathers because you know him who is from the beginning. I'm writing to you young men because you have overcome the evil one. And we, and we look at this, and, and I, I, I've read this a hundred times, and I didn't realize that when John is writing to one church, he's writing to one early church, he is categorizing three different groups of people within one church. And he says, I'm writing to you little children. Because your sins have been forgiven. Now, now, and I began to think about this. I was like, oh, he's talking about spiritual maturity. And what I love about John's vocabulary is, and, and what I love about the early church, you know, Paul's vocabulary and Peter's vocabulary in the New Testament as they began to write, is the, the, they always use the vocabulary, Jesus did it as well, of when they talk about the, fam the family of God, they talk about the family of God, they always use family terms, you know, sons, daughters you know you, you know, Paul said in Romans you know I've been adopted as a son into the family of God you know and then he says and then now John's saying little children young men and fathers it's, they're not using business terms 
And they're not using religious terms. They're using family terms. And this is so key. Look, watch, now watch. If we use business terms to determine, you know, the state of, in our churches, we create hierarchies because that's what businesses are, is hierarchies. And, and we read things because in our, in our Roman uh, uh, mentality and, and our British mentality, I can classify myself in that. Canada is, we're British. Um, in, in our mentality, our mentality, we like hierarchies. We understand hierarchies. Roman culture, when Jesus was around and when the early disciples were around with Roman culture, it was hierarchies. That's, where, that's our roots. That's, that's, that, that was what Jesus was dealing with, and they understood. But Jesus never talked about hierarchies. He never used business terms. Now, if you use religious terms, religious terms are, you know, they, they, uh, religious terms will, will do, use hierarchies as well, and, and they'll point down, and everybody's got to serve up. And Jesus came along and used different terminology and says, you want to be great? You serve. The higher you go, the more you serve, which was opposite of the hierarchy. And they use family terms. And Jesus said to Nicodemus, he says, you want, you know, how do I get saved, Nicodemus said. And Jesus says, well, you've got to be born again. And without even realizing it, Jesus is using family terms. His starting point was a birth, a rebirth. And, and then Paul said, you know, you get adopted as, as a son. You become a son a joint heir with Christ. So we look at this, and, and this is, I, I'm a visual person, so I need to see things in picture. Now, I want you to follow along with me for a second. This is the process of discipleship. If this, this pulpit was, was a, a table, seated at this, at this end of the table would be, at the entry point would be the born again. This is born again chair. Okay, and Jesus says, how do you get born again? And how, how do you, get, how do you, get born again well you just believe and Paul said it this way you confess with your mouth that Jesus is God and if you believe in your heart that Jesus rose again from the dead you will be saved you will get born again just Jesus said just simply believe in me it, it was not a difficult process it was simply believe in Jesus that, that was it there, and there's that's the chair then then John says, I write to you little children. So he's writing to the church of people who've already been born again, but he's categorizing them, and he's saying, in this chair, we have little children. And what is interesting about little children, this is what's, what I find fascinating about the thing, is that you know, I, I, it's easy for me to kind of understand this. We have six children, my wife and I. We, have, we, we are three oldest uh, naturally born to us, the three youngest uh, we adopted. Um, our three oldest, our oldest is, is turning 18 in, in a week. I know uh, we don't look that old. <laughs> told that a lot. Oi, lo no. um, Just kidding. Um, but it's hard for me to believe. Uh, but but we, you know, we have 18, 16, 15. Um, and then our, our, our three youngest are, are seven, six, and then we have a six-month-old baby. Now, Little children, there's a difference between how we treat and how we father and mother our little ones compared to our young men. And there's some uniqueness in, in, in this. And watch, our, our little ones, listen, our little baby, her only form of communication is to make noise. I don't rebuke her. For making noise at three in the morning, be quiet. Stop it. I mean, that would be that'd be cruel, right? She's she's noisy. She makes messes that she can't clean up herself. Like, what is wrong with her? You know, and yet we love little babies, don't we? But all they do is make messes and mess up our schedule. And yet we love them unconditionally. Isn't that just, isn't that strange? Right? They, they can't even talk. They can't even tell us they, lo they love us. They, 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 there's no way to communication. Yet we love them like crazy. There's, when, when our children were first born, I was like, wow, there's, there's a whole room of your heart that opens up. And you're going, man, I didn't even know I could love this. Wow. And they haven't even said anything yet. They haven't, re you know, reproduced it at all yet. But wow. And little children... They can't feed themselves. We have to feed them. And they're messy. 
Oh, Lord have mercy. Right? I mean, our six-year-old, his room. Oh, Jesus. Help us. You know what he said to us the other day? Um, we, have a, we have a lady that, that cleans the church, and, and she comes in once a week and cleans our house. Her, her name is Gladys. And our six-year-old, we were saying, you know, you know Kai, you need to go and, and clean your room. He's like, ah, oh, Miss Gladys will clean it. Oh. Oh, no, you didn't. <laughs> no, no, that's not, no, no, that is not the response. That's, no. It's not how it works. But little children, there's, there's a de- they're completely dependent. Now, now, our young men, we don't have to spoon feed our teenagers anymore. Thank God. We don't have to clean up the same kind of message. Thank God. You know, I don't, have to, I don't even have to tell my teenagers to eat. They do it all by themselves. <laughs> Often. I, this is, there's a phenomena in, in teenagers, in teenage boys, where they can, they'll eat a full, you know, full meal, clean off mom's plate, dad, are you going to finish that, eat that whole thing, and then and you clean off everything that's in there, and we're going, wow, where'd they put that, and then a half an hour later, the fridge door, we don't have to feed them. They do just, just fine. All we have to do is feed the fridge, and they're good to go. <laughs> and, and young men, as they become young men, they become very independent. Little children are very dependent, but young men become very independent. And they are strong, and they, and they are the ones that we send off to battle because they're indestructible, and they're strong, and they can take it, they, and, and they do this. That's the young, that's the young man. But look at how John writes about young men. I'm writing to you young men, and he says in, in uh, later on in verse 14, I write to you young men because you are strong and have overcome the evil one. The little children, he says, your sins have been forgiven. He's basically telling them, listen, the, first, the biggest battle you have to face in, your, in the youngest stages of your, of your relationship with Jesus is, is grace. The biggest battle you have to you overcome is that, man, you, you've been forgiven. You, you, God, God accepts you when, even though you don't feel like you earn it. Your biggest struggle as a little child is still sin. Isn't that right? And I, I have people saying, well, Pastor Kelly, I... I said, there's people smoking outside your church. They shouldn't be smoking outside your church. That's awesome. That's a sign of a healthy church. (laughs) That means I got some little children who's still struggling with some of the... Oh, there's people... Do you know there's people in your church that aren't married, that are living together? Yeah, that's good. What? They're Christians. They shouldn't. Listen, they make, little children make messes and we don't complain about, it's pastoring little children. It's going to be messy church. You do counseling and they tell you in counseling, you know, don't act shocked. I've had had some counseling sessions where people come in, they confess what they're struggling with and I was like, don't look shocked, don't look shocked. (laughs) After they leave, what? <laughs> and then I quote Proverbs, Proverbs 1 and going, hey, stupid, how long are you going to stay stupid? But listen, but listen, I don't kick them out of the church because they're struggling with something. That's ridiculous. I don't, kick, I don't kick my babies out because they poop their diapers. They made a mess. That's ridiculous. You clean it up. Now watch, as they progress, I'm not changing my teenage boys. They've got to get to a place where the definition of a child is a mismanager. Parents. Your job as a parent is to teach your child how to manage. They mismanage their, their rooms, they mismanage their clothes, they mismanage their eating habits, they mismanage all these And you teach the finances, they mismanage everything. You don't, I don't give the the keys to the car to drive the car to my to my six year old. I'd give them to my eighteen year old and my sixteen year old. They could, they have the keys. 
they can drive the car, but I wouldn't give it to my six. There's different levels of responsibility and maturity as we go along. And this is what this is the, the scene that, that John is setting for us. But young men, they get to a place where they mature and they're strong. The battle for the young men is, is you overcome the evil one. You are strong and have overcome the evil one. And you're strong because you're in the word, it says. 1 John 14. In other words, th these little children, they don't know how to feed themselves. They rely on others to feed them. If the only, if the only, if your, your biggest struggle right now is over, is still sin, and the only feeding you get is Sunday mornings, the only time you open your word Sunday mornings, you're probably still in the little children's chair. Well, I've been saved for 20 years. It, it doesn't matter. It does, he's not talking age. The way that you mature to the young men is you have you you know the word and you've gotten in the word and you've become a self feeder and you feed yourself in the word daily. You're not reliant anymore on your pastor to feed you. You're now beginning to feed yourself. It's not it's not that your father doesn't have to feed you anymore. You begin to feed yourself and you become strong. And when you begin to feed yourself, it's the same thing. When Jesus was tempted by the devil, what did he use? He used the word. He came, it came out of him. It just came out of him and he flowed. And there gets a point this is this is awesome by the way it gets to a point where you're not fighting the devil maybe the devil did this the devil did that the devil did this. and when you get strong enough the devil learns he's not stupid he learns well he is kind of stupid but <laughs> he will learn eventually to leave you alone Amen. don't mess with that boy how the devil messing with us when he first got into ministry like just weird stuff, you know, things that just happen and, and, and you're going, this is, this is too unnatural to be natural. I was like, this is demonic. This is demonic all over the place. And one night I got fed up and uh, something happened in our, in our family. And I was like, okay, this, this is the devil. And I just recognized, I clued in my lightning fast brain. This is demonic. So I, I went into a room, yelled at the devil, and I said, you can hit me. Come on. You can hit me. But I want you to know I'm going to hit back. And I said, you hit me once, I'm hitting back. And I marched right out of there, marched across the street into a pub, and, and, and sat down with somebody, led them to Jesus, and walked out and said, huh, <laughs> bring it. You hit, I'm hitting back. Eventually, he clues in. And you move from one chair to the next. And you get to the place where now, watch, you go from little children to young men to fathers. It doesn't say old men. It says fathers. Biology lesson. How does a young man become a father? I don't have to fill in the blanks. We got it all figured out. How does that happen? They reproduce. Reproduce. And I realized when Jesus says, go into all the world and make disciples, what he's saying is go into all the world, make a convert, feed them, clean them, help them, teach them how to feed themselves and manage themselves where they become independent, and then, and then have, them, have them to bring them to maturity where they reproduce and make a convert, and little children, young men, and make a convert, little children, young men, take it to, and just, you just go through, and this is the process. This is the process. The battle of father fights is no longer his own battles. The battle of father fights is somebody else's. He's helping somebody else. He's fighting, he's fighting, helping someone else through their messes and their sins. He's helping somebody else fight the devil and overcome. He's teaching them and he's getting the word in them. And they take the responsibility. A, a father is very interdependent. Where, where a little child is very dependent, become independent, become very interdependent. We become interdependent on one another. Now watch. There's a, we got four chairs. Do you know that Paul adds a fifth chair? Look at this. You don't believe me. Look, I want to show you a scripture. This is crazy. 1 Corinthians 3, I'm going to read it out of the Message Bible. 
This is, this, is, this is Pastor Paul, meek and mild, gentle Pastor Paul writing to the church. This is his sermon to the church. This is what he says. He says, but for right now, friends, I'm completely frustrated by your unspiritual dealings with one another and with God. Uh-oh. Not a good sermon. He says, you're acting like infants in relation to Christ, capable of nothing more than nursing at the breast. What did he just say? You're sitting in this chair. I'm frustrated. Now, look, is it, is it, it's weird to say you're frustrated with, like, it's not, I'm not frustrated with my six, six-month-old baby because she's doing it, but he's frustrated because he's saying, look what he says. He says, well, then, I'll nurse you since you don't seem capable of anything more as long as you grab for what you make, makes you feel good, makes you look important. Are you really much different than a babe at the breast, content only when everything's going your way? way Uh huh why is he frustrated he's not frustrated because of the little children in his church he's frustrated because in other parts of this thing he's saying you should have matured by now you should have been moved on from that chair by now but I'm frustrated because you're still sitting in this chair by this time you should have matured I would be extremely frustrated if I was still changing an 18 year old's diaper you should have known better by now. Yeah. Look at this. The writer of Hebrews in, ver- in chapter 5, verse, verse 11 says, I have a lot more to say about this, but it's hard to get it across uh, since you've picked up this bad habit of not listening. <laughs> now look at, look at what he says. By this time, you ought to be teachers yourselves. By this time in your maturity, you ought to be fathers yet here I find someone to sit down with you and go over the basics on God again starting from square one baby's milk when you should have been on food solid food long ago milk is for beginners in experiencing God's way solid food is for the mature who have some practice in telling right from wrong (laughs) oh what a sermon So come on, let's leave the preschool finger-painting exercise on Christ and get on the grand work of God. Grow up! That's what he says. Now watch. Now look at, look at, look at, look at. Ah, this is good. You got, got this, 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 this discipleship. There's a fifth chair. These two passages. There's a fifth chair, and it's positioned right on this corner. And the fifth chair is a high chair. And what, what John says, and John says it in verse, in, in verse 15 in the, in the message. He says, don't love the world's ways. You know, don't love the world's good. Love the world squeezes out the love of our Father. Practice everything that goes on in the world. Wanting your own way. Wanting everything for yourself. Wanting to appear important. This is, this is how you get into the high chair. Has nothing to do with the Father, but isolates you from Him. In other words, you get to this place in maturity where you start as little children. You should mature to young men. But somewhere along the way, you become insider focused. It becomes all about wanting my own way, making me look important, all about me. And church is all about me. And, and church, you know, I want church to go my way. And pastor, you're not feeding me. And pastor, you're not doing this. And then this is not going on. And I want the music to be this way. And I want this to be this way. And it's all about me. And you climb right into this nice little high chair when you should be a father. And, and, and the writer of, of, of Hebrews and, and Paul in Corinthians says, I'm frustrated with you. By this time, you should have been reproducing and making disciples. But you, instead, you climbed into the high chair. Have you ever taken a two-year-old to a restaurant? You don't have conversation with anybody else. Because a two-year-old, you know, a one-and-a-half-year-old pounds it. We don't have to teach our children to say, me and mine. We do have to teach them how to say please and thank you. But they'll sit there and pound and want their own way and want their own way and all the tension and watch. When you climb into the high chair, well, listen to me, climb into the high chair, the father has to take his, turn his attention to the, to the high chair. And where does he turn his back? He turns his back on the unchurched. The ones coming into the church get born again. When you ought to be reproducing and be fathers yourself, you're distracting from the fathers from reproducing. This is the sickness in the church. Listen, you know what Paul said? 
Paul said in 1 Corinthians 4, there's a lot of people around you who can't wait to tell you what you've done wrong. But there aren't many fathers willing to take the time and effort to help you grow up. He's not writing to pastors. We call our pastors fathers, ministers, when we're all supposed to be fathers and ministers. The pastors are supposed to equip the saints for the work of the ministry, be fathers and ministers. When you go into all the world and make disciples, you're supposed to be a disciple yourself. Listen, church, listen, listen, listen. listen. Pastors, teach your church this process. I taught my church this way, and people come up to me now, and they're going, Pastor, I just don't feel... I'm not in the high chair, but I just want you to know that I don't feel like... I just give them a look and smile. This last move of God is an all saints move. And Paul says, There's no, we have lots of teachers waiting to tell you what you've done wrong, but we don't have many fathers willing to take the time and make disciples. Don't be a teacher waiting for, to, to tell everybody what they're doing wrong. Be a father. Be a mother. We're just hey, Make a disciple. Invite an unchurched person to church. Here's what happens. If you don't reproduce as young, this is the stage. This is why I put the high chair here. If you don't reproduce and make a disciple yourself, the natural tendency for every human being is to become insider focused and church becomes about me. But when I reproduce, church becomes about them. And I, have you ever gone to a movie a second time, but you went with somebody who didn't see it? You're more excited to watch the movie because, because of their reaction. It's the same thing when you go to church and you're looking at it through their eyes and you begin to see your church through their eyes and you're discipling them and making it. All of a sudden, church becomes vibrant and alive. That's natural. That's what church is supposed to be. That's what we're all supposed to do. So listen, 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 this is, this is my, I can fly back to Canada tomorrow. Listen, church, make disciples. Listen, church, according to the words of Paul, grow up. Become fathers. This, this, this is how Pastor George says it. And this is my challenge for you. This is, this is the, I'll finish with this challenge. Love one, win one, disciple one. Love one, win one, disciple one. In this next year, this is what I encourage you to do. Write the name of three people down. Three names down that you want to see come to Jesus in the next year. In 2015, I want these three people to come to Jesus. Write three names down. These are three people, f three friends I have. And you put that list up. That's your, that's your target list. That's, your, that's the list that you're going to pray through. And, and then you're saying, God, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to love them. Whatever I can do, I'm going to get close to them. I'm praying for them every single day. Just by praying for them, your heart's going to be drawn to them. And then, and, then, and then you prayed the prayer we learned last night. God, give me boldness. God, give me boldness. And then you say, God, give me the opportunity. And there's going to be an opportunity that comes along. And, and an opportunity. God, give me an opportunity to share about you. God, give me an opportunity to invite them to church. God, give me an opportunity, whatever it might be. God, give me an opportunity. And watch what happens. Love one. Win one disciple one become a father and then what do you do as a father you take them through the process of being born again clean up their messes and their battles with sin teach them how to read the word of God on their own they become young men become strong then teach them how to reproduce that's the process that's the how if each one of you loved one wind one, discipled one, this church would double in the next year. That's church growth. Same process. Same method. It's worked for thousands of years in whatever nation will work for you. 
Amen. 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 Praise God. Hallelujah. Yes, will.